come into this place, be with us here during this morning and during these words, that our hearts may be open, that you may touch them with your reconciling love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So as many of you know, um, I've just returned a couple of weeks ago now from a couple of weeks in Jerusalem um, during the worst of the conflict in Gaza and in Israel. And though I did not personally witness any of the bombing, um, we did experience at close range what it looked like and felt like for two peoples who are deeply related to each other, Palestinians and Israelis, two peoples of the same mother and father, sisters and brothers, so to speak, but peoples who have little trust with each other and much prejudice about each other, people who were choosing tactics of escalation and resorting to violence, the worst of which involved innocence in the destruction of life and home. And it might seem that this is an intransigent conflict. It's just gone on for too long. But it made me reflect on what I want to preach to you about this morning, which is um, the story of reconciliation that we heard in the Old Testament lesson that Missy so beautifully read. So. Um, so first, um, this, this is a story, of course, about Joseph. And those of you who have been here either last week or the week before know that we're telling these stories of Joseph um, just now. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to explore something about our faith that comes to us from the Old Testament. And in this morning's story, Joseph, who we left last week having been sent on a caravan by his brothers off to Egypt for slavery... And the brothers had gone back to the father and said he had died. Well, now several years later, Joseph, having a lot of natural gifts and talents, had risen higher than any Jewish person had ever risen in Pharaoh's court, had all kinds of um, administrative responsibilities. And he indeed was the person that these brothers of his, who had sent him off into slavery, were coming to Egypt to actually seek sustenance from because there had been a famine that had gone from Egypt all the way up into the Canaan land where they had come from. So the father had sent them down there and there they were begging for food and sustenance from unbeknownst to them, their brother. And so this lesson that we just heard was the very passionate um, encounter when Joseph is revealing to his brothers his heart having almost been wrenched open and their confusion, but also their hearts being wrenched open. It's where Joseph uh, identifies himself for his brothers and says that which you intended for ill has turned out to be good. And now I, you know, I can share with you, with my father and my brothers, all that, uh, that we can share here in Egypt and you can bring them down here and live here and be here in a safe place so that our line might continue. And so that's, that's the story, basically, of the reconciliation and the great pathos of, this, of, of these, these brothers coming together and weeping on each other's necks. And just think, Joseph, who's uh, presumably in some great hall, has shut everyone out except his brothers, and he cries so loudly for the deep sort of primal connection that he feels with these brothers, that they can hear him beyond the walls as he identifies himself and welcomes them, obviously forgiving them and initiating a reconciliation. <coughs> so the, the history with brothers is, or brothers and sisters is not always easy. You know, there were these brothers who were playing together and the older brother doing imaginary games, the older brother always wanted to be Robin and play Robin Hood. And so, you know, the younger brother would take the less important role of Friar Tuck. So they played this imagine these two little boys played this imaginary game for many, many months, and the little brother kept saying to the older brother, when do I get to be Robin? When do I get to be Robin? And, you know, Day after day, he got to only be Friar Tuck. And so one day, the older brother said to him, said, okay, so you can be Robin today. Now, oh, he was just thrilled. And he sort of puffed out, and he was thinking of how he was going to act out Robin and all that stuff. 
well, I'm going to be Robin, then who are you going to be? And the older brother said, Batman. <laughs> um, it seems that there are competitions and ways of being that, um, with brothers that maybe we never get over. A little closer to home for me, when I think about that conflict that I reflect on over in the Middle East, and I think about how long it's gone on, um, and uh, it can be wearisome to hear about over, you know, for, for many, many years. But I'm, I'm reminded of a conflict that's closer to my own roots and my own ancestry, the conflict that went on in Ireland. And I'm reminded of the troubles there. Most of you know that, that the English really controlled Ireland, that Ireland was an occupied territory since early 1600s, and that the troubles that eventually during the 20th century led to the Good Friday Peace Agreement finally in 1998 that is held, but the troubles included a lot of enmity between brothers of the same father and mother, children of the British Isles. Um, unlike some of the conflicts that we're experiencing in the Middle East, the conflict in Ireland was between Christians, Protestants and Catholics, Ireland having been mostly Catholic and then um, the English having brought settlers who were Protestants to the northern part. And we know of the bombings and the terrorism and the real frustration on two sides, on two sides of that. The economic deprivation of the Irish because the British were in control of land and the means for commerce and those kinds of things. So the Irish got left out. And finally, <coughs> after three centuries, and in, that, in the 20th century, uh, really worked hard to regain their identity. And thank goodness, the reconciliation that really was finally achieved after lots of false starts and lots of, uh, lots of agreements and then disagreements uh, people lost their lives, but reconcil reconciliation was achieved finally, and we hope continues now for 16 years in that land. But I need to tell you that when Stephen and I visited Ireland three years ago, um, we went to find the land where one of his ancestors had actually occupied as an Englishman um, in County Cork. So we got out to this sort of town, and I have to say, we were greeted as we investigated this place where his ancestor had stayed. We were greeted by a kind of interested local history group, and they were pretty nice to us. And it seemed really, you know, it seemed like we were having this really interesting discussion about what had gone on there in early 1600s. But we got to the actual land to look where the property had been and the house had been for this ancestor of Stevens. And the woman, the wife of the man who was the homeowner, he came out and he greeted us, but she wouldn't come out. And she literally wouldn't come out and say hello. And he said, quite frankly, at the beginning of the conversation, you know, you haven't been very good to us. And this ancestor of yours, was not very good to us either, and she's not wanting to come out and greet you. Reconciliation takes a long time, and we carry, generation after generation, um, we carry the pains and the hurts that are often in our people and in our family and are related to our land. So there were these two men who had been business partners down in Mississippi. And I came to know this true story because I put reconciliation into my Google search and up came a bunch of YouTube videos. And I know the story of these two men because one of their sons did a video that he entitled Reconciliation, that told their story. So these two men had been in business together for 30 years. And related 
into the way the business needed to go forward, they both had a different opinion about that. And they were so fierce in their opinion about the next step of the business that they stopped talking to each other. They had a big fight. And sure enough, the business began to go down. They needed to bring lawyers in. The lawyers had to negotiate what was going on with it. They finally had to dissolve their partnership, dissolve the business, and distribute the assets. And so these two men who had been close for their entire adult lives and their families had been close ended up with a break in their relationship. Now, sure enough, they went to the same church. And one of them was a church leader. So the other thought, gosh, I can't keep showing up at church. He's the leader there. So didn't go to church for three years, right? Didn't want to run into this nasty business partner of his. So he stayed home. But one day, after three years, his son came to him and said, hey, Dad, when are we going to start going back to our church? And he had to think about it. So he went. And he prayed about it, and he thought about it. And he said, I'm not going to let my enmity for this former business partner really interrupt my family's worship of God. So he told the son, we'll go back next Sunday. But in his mind, he was inventing all kinds of strategies so he didn't have to run into his business partner. So they got to, they got to the, the church door, and they, as they were walking in, he spies his former business partner up front, of course, getting ready for the service. So he says to his son, son, take a seat. I left something in the truck. I'll be back. And he goes back out to his truck, and he sits down for a while and thinks about this. And then he hears the music start up, so he knows the service has started. So he thinks, I think I'll be safe by now. He'll have found a seat in a pew and not a problem. And he gets to the front door and he opens the, the front door, which is actually in the back. He opens that and he thinks, but let me just go into the bathroom for a minute so I can think about this because he's starting to lose his courage. So he goes into the bathroom and sure enough, as he walks out of the stall, he comes face to face with his business partner, his old business partner. The walls break down. They look at each other in the eye. Even when they retell the story on YouTube, they have tears in their eyes. And they say, I'm really sorry. Now in the video, no one ever admits who was really right or wrong, because they're still mad about who was right or wrong. But they say, I'm sorry. And they say, I've missed you. And they decide not to fight anymore. And they go back into church together. <clears throat> now that's not the end of the story because the man with the son who had not been to church for three years had a daughter he hadn't seen for five. So he got in his truck and he drove an hour to where his daughter lived and he sat on, on the porch at her house and waited for her to come home from work. She got out of the car and was very wary, but saw her father, said, hello. So what brings you here now to see me after all these years? And he said, well, I have to tell you a story about the bathroom at church. <laughs> and he told her his story. And he began to see his daughter again. So the front of your program, did anyone see it? It's a sculpture. It's a sculpture called Reconciliation. And it's a sculpture by Josefina de Vasconelos. And it was placed in St. Michael's Cathedral in Coventry. Who's been there? To that cathedral that was bombed in 1940 by the Luftwaffe? Okay, and you sort of seen that? Coventry Cathedral, the day after the bombing, the provost there said, we're not going to let hatred and violence be the last word. And so they claimed, they claimed what 
they thought was hope for the future and reconciliation and peace. And that has become their ministry for these 60 plus years. They actually have an active ministry of peace and reconciliation around the world because they were not going to let, they were not going to let this, this violence that was done to them be the last word, but they were going to act out of faith for hope in the future of the world. And this statue that you see there of the two people, it's actually a man and a woman, comes from the artist's actual experience of watching two people lost to each other in the Second World War, finding each other again. Um, and so this particular statue has been sent to other places around the world. There is a statue just like this in the ruins at Hiroshima in their Peace Park. There is a statue just like this in the Stormont Castle in Belfast, Northern Ireland. There is a statue just like this at the Berlin Wall Memorial that was put there on the day of the opening of the new Reichstag, the Parliament Building, in Berlin in 1999. While Stephen and I were in Jerusalem, we called a friend we had made two years ago, Toshiko Mizumoto. Toshiko is a Japanese woman, as it turns out, a Christian who grew up in Hiroshima. She was there, was born three years after we dropped the atomic bomb there. And she, for her whole life, has been committed to peace. We met her through our Jewish friend, the wife of Moshe Dayan, who was the former defense minister of Israel, um, who was a, uh, still alive and a 98-year-old fierce woman, but a woman who knew well Palestinians and Israelis and Christians and has forged relationships with lots of folks all over that region and around the world. So Toshiko is accomplished in, in the world as a textile person. And she brought her considerable talent to work in the international arena. But for the last 18 years, with no pay, and she confesses that she is very fortunate to have a partner who indeed has the economic capacity to support them both. But for no pay, Toshiko has developed a relationship with and helped develop a business in the West Bank with a group of poor Palestinian women where they do needlework and they make all kinds of textiles. And um, for her, this is just part of her peacemaking. She's, these are Muslim women, she's a Christian, she's Japanese, they're Mideastern, and she works with this group and has worked with them for 18 years. She markets their, their products through friends all over the world, and she has built this trust um, with them in a way that, that she has this privilege, and we have the privilege to meet them and to know her. She would not consider herself a saint. If I called her a reconciler, she would be shy and, and tell me that, you know, that's really not what she does. But every, every week, she makes a visit there and helps them do their business. So Israel and Palestine are still fighting, and it seems as if that fighting is contagious all over the Middle East. But you know, it just might also be a place of the intersection of hope and reconciliation. And I happen to believe that reconciliation and hope can be as contagious as fighting. Like the story in Joseph, what we intended as destruction in Hiroshima has implanted something in the heart of a Japanese woman that has been for great good for a group of Palestinian women living in the West Bank. That 
what was intended for harm, God has taken and made for good. The God who never gives up on any of us, but the God who is always actively seeking our change of heart and the change of our ways in our lives, in the lives of our brothers and sisters and in the world. These stories of reconciliation are hard for me to preach to you today. At the time of the settling of my mother's estate about seven years ago, I have a sister who for years of competition has chosen um, not to be in touch with me. It's a great sadness. We're deeply related. We fortunately see each other's kids. Um, and we live so far away that I wonder if we'll ever come out of a bathroom and encounter each other. <laughs> I doubt that. But I think reconciliation is hard. It's really hard. Um, but God can take even what is not well intended and can turn it into some great good. So um, I hope for that in my life. And I hope for that in yours. I think we're called as Christians to be anchors as well as ambassadors of God's reconciling love for each of us and for all of creation. Amen.